Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Gold Hunters by J. D. Borthwick. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Some of the streets of the upper part of the city presented a very singular appearance. The houses had been built before the grade of the different streets had been fixed by the corporation and there were places where the streets, having been cut down through the hills to their proper level, were nothing more than wide trenches with a perpendicular bank on either side, perhaps forty or fifty feet high, and on the brink of these stood the houses, to which access was gained by ladders and temporary wooden stairs, the unfortunate proprietor being obliged to go to the expense of grading his own lot, and so bringing himself down to a level with the rest of the world. In other places, where the street crossed a deep hollow, it formed a high embankment, with a row of houses at the foot of it, some nearly buried, and others already raised to the level of the street, resting on a sort of scaffolding, while the foundation was being filled in under them. The soil was so sandy that the hills were easily cut down, and for this purpose a contrivance was used called a steam paddy, which did immense execution. It was worked by steam, and was somewhat on the principle of a dredging machine, but with only one large bucket, which cut down about two tons of earth at a time, and emptied itself into a truck placed alongside. From the spot where the paddy was thus walking into the hills, a railway was laid, extending to the shore, and trains of cars were continually rattling down across the streets, taking the earth to fill up those parts of the city which were as yet under water. Two or three years later, in 54, when an alteration was made in the grade of some of the streets, large brick and stone houses were raised several feet by means of a most ingenious application of hydraulic pressure excavations were made and under the foundation walls of the houses were inserted a number of cylinders about two feet in height so that the building rested entirely on the heads of the pistons the cylinders were all connected by pipes with a force pump worked by a couple of men who in this way could pump up a five-story brick building three or four inches in the course of a day as the house grew up props were inserted in case of accidents and when it had been raised as far as the length of the pistons would allow the whole apparatus was readjusted and the operation was repeated till the required height was obtained I went to witness the process when it was being applied to a large corner brick building, five stories high, with about sixty feet frontage each way. The flagged sidewalk was being raised along with it, but there was no interruption of the business going on in the premises, or anything whatever to indicate to the passer-by that the ground was growing under his feet. On going down under the house, one saw that the building was detached from the surrounding ground and rested on a number of cylinders, but the only appearance of work being done was by two men quietly working a pump amid a ramification of small iron pipes. The apparatus had, of course, to be of an immense strength to withstand the pressure to which it was subjected, and the utmost nicety was required in its adjustment to avoid straining and cracking the walls. But numbers of large buildings were raised most successfully in this way, without receiving the slightest injury. The hackney carriages of San Francisco were infinitely superior to those of any other city in the world. One might have supposed that any old cab which would hold together would have been good enough for such a place, but on the contrary, the cabs, if cabs they could be called, were large, handsome carriages, lined in silk, and brightly painted and polished, drawn by pairs of magnificent horses in harness, 
which, like the carriages, was loaded with silver. They would have passed anywhere for showy private equipages, had the drivers only been in livery, instead of being fashionably dressed individuals in kid gloves. A London cabby would have stared in astonishment at an apparition of a stand of such cabs, and also at the fares which were charged. One could not cross the street in them under five dollars. The scale of cab fares, however, was not out of proportion to the extravagance of other ordinary expenses. The drivers probably received two or three hundred dollars a month, about seven hundred pounds a year, and the horses alone were worth from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars each. None of the private carriages came at all near the hacks in splendor. They were mostly of the American buggy character, and were drawn by fast-trotting horses. The Americans have a style and taste in driving peculiarly their own. They study neither grace nor comfort in their attitudes. Speed is the only source of pleasure. And a three-minute horse that is to say, one which trots his mile in three minutes, is the only horse worth driving, while anything slower than a 240, two minutes 40 seconds horse, is not considered really fast. A great many fine horses had been imported from Sydney, but these were chiefly used in drays and under the saddle. The buggy horses were all American and had made the journey across the plains. The native Californian horses are small, with great powers of endurance, but are generally not very tractable in harness. On the arrival of the fortnightly steamer from Panama, with the mails from the Atlantic States and from Europe, the distribution of letters at the post office occasioned a very singular scene. In the United States, the system of delivering letters by postmen is not carried to the same extent as in this country. In San Francisco, no such thing existed as a postman. Everyone had to call at the post office for his letters. The mail usually consisted of several wagon loads of letter bags, and on its being received, notice was given at the post office at what hour the delivery would commence a whole day being frequently required to sort the letters, which were then delivered from a row of a half-dozen windows, lettered A to E, F to K, and so on through the alphabet. Independently of the immense mercantile correspondence, of course every man in the city was anxiously expecting letters from home, and for hours before the appointed time for opening the windows, a dense crowd of people collected, almost blocking up the two streets which gave access to the post office, and having appearance at a distance of a mob. But on coming up to it, one would find that, though closely packed together, the people were all in six strings, twisted up and down in all directions, the commencement of them being the lucky individuals who had been first on the ground, and taken up their position at their respective windows, while each newcomer had to fall in behind those already waiting. Notwithstanding the value of time, and the impatience felt by every individual, the most perfect order prevailed. There was no such thing as a man attempting to push himself in ahead of those already waiting, nor was there the slightest respect of persons, Every newcomer quietly took his position and had to make the best of it, with the prospect of waiting for hours before he could hope to reach the window. Smoking and chewing tobacco were great aids in passing the time, and many came provided with books and newspapers, which they could read in perfect tranquility, as there was no unnecessary crowding or jostling. The principle of first come, first served, was strictly adhered to, and any attempt to infringe the established rule would have been promptly put down by the omnipotent majority. A man's place in the line was his individual property, more or less valuable according to his distance from the window. 
and like any other piece of property it was bought and sold and converted into cash those who had plenty of dollars to spare but could not afford much time could buy out someone who had already spent several hours in keeping his place ten or fifteen dollars were frequently paid for a good position and some men went there early and waited patiently without any expectation of getting letters but for the chance of turning their acquired advantage into cash the post office clerks got through their work briskly enough when once they commenced the delivery the alphabetical system of arrangement enabling them to produce the letters immediately on the name being given one was not kept long in suspense and many a poor fellow's face lengthened out into a doleful expression of disbelief and disappointment as scarcely had he uttered his name when he was promptly told there was nothing for him this was a sentence from which there was no appeal however incredulous one might be and every man was incredulous for during the hour or two he had been waiting he had become firmly convinced in his own mind that there must be a letter for him and it was no satisfaction at all to see the clerk surrounded as he was by thousands of letters take only a packet of a dozen or so in which to look for it one would like to have had the post office searched all over and if without success would still have thought there was something wrong i was myself upon one occasion deeply impressed with this spirit of unbelief in the infallibility of the post office oracle and tried the effect of another application the next day when my perseverance was crowned with success there was one window devoted exclusively to the use of foreigners among whom english were not included and here a polyglot individual who would have been a useful member of society of the tower of babel answered the demands of all european nations and held communication with chinamen sandwich islanders and all the stray specimens of humanity from unknown parts of the earth one reason why men went to little trouble or expense in making themselves comfortable in their homes if homes they could be called was the constant danger of fire the city was a mass of wooden and canvas buildings the very look of which suggested the idea of a conflagration a room was a mere partitioned off place the walls of which were sometimes only of canvas though generally of boards loosely put together and covered with any sort of material which happened to be most convenient cotton cloth printed calico or drugget frequently papered as if to render it more inflammable floors and walls were by no means so exclusive as one is accustomed to think them they were not transparent certainly but otherwise they ensured little privacy a general conversation could be very easily carried on by all the dwellers in a house while at the same time each of them was enjoying the seclusion such as it was of his own apartment a young lady who was boarding at one of the hotels very feelingly remarked that it was a most disagreeable place to live in because if any gentleman was to pop the question to her the report would be audible in every part of the house and all the other inmates would be waiting to hear the answer she might give the cry of fire is dreadful enough anywhere but to any one who lived in san francisco in those days it must ever be more exciting and more suggestive of disaster and destruction of property than it can be to those who have been all their lives surrounded by brick and stone and insurance companies in other countries when a fire occurs and a large amount of property is destroyed the loss falls on a company a body without a soul having no individual identity and for which no one save perhaps a few of the shareholders has the slightest sympathy the loss being sustained by an unknown quantity as it were is not appreciated 
but in San Francisco no such institution as insurance against fire as yet existed. To insure a house there would have been as great a risk as to insure a New York steamer two or three weeks overdue. By degrees, brick buildings were superseding those of wood and pasteboard, but still, for the whole city, destruction by fire, sooner or later, was the dreaded and fully expected doom. When such a combustible town once ignited in any one spot, the flames, of course, spread so rapidly that every part, however distant, stood nearly an equal chance of being consumed. The alarm of fire acted like the touch of a magician's wand. The vitality of the whole city was in an instant arrested and turned from its course. Theaters, saloons, and all public places were emptied as quickly as if the buildings themselves were on fire. The business of the moment, whatever it was, was at once abandoned, and the streets became filled with people rushing frantically in every direction not all towards the fire by any means. Few thought it worth while to ask even where it was. To know there was fire somewhere was quite sufficient, and they made at once for their house or their store, or wherever they had any property that might be saved, while as soon as the alarm was given, the engines were heard thundering along the streets, amid the ringing of the fire bells and the shouts of the excited crowd. The fire companies, of which several were already organized, were on the usual American system. Volunteer companies of citizens who receive no pay, but are exempt from serving on juries and from some other citizens' duties. They have crack fire companies just as we have crack regiments, and of these the fast young men of the upper classes are frequently the most enthusiastic members. Each company has its own officers, but they are all under control of a chief engineer who is appointed by the city and who directs the general plan of operations at a fire. There is great rivalry among the different companies who vie with each other in making their turnout as handsome as possible. They each have their own uniform, but the nature of their duties does not admit of much finery in their dress. Red shirts and helmets are the principal features in it. Their engines, however, are got up in very magnificent style, being most elaborately painted, all the ironwork shining like polished steel and heavily mounted with brass or silver. They are never drawn by horses but by the firemen themselves. A long double coil of rope is attached to the engine and is paid out as the crowd increases till the engine appears to be tearing and bumping along in pursuit of a long, narrow mob of men who run as if the very devil himself were after them. Their esprit de corps is very strong and connected with the different engine houses are reading rooms, saloons, and so on, for the use of the members of the company, many of these places being in the same style of luxurious magnificence as the most fashionable hotels. On holidays, and on every possible occasion which offers an excuse for so doing, the whole fire brigade parade the streets in full dress, each company dragging their engine after them, decked out in flags and flowers, which are presented to them by their lady admirers in return for the balls given by the firemen for their entertainment. They also have field days when they all turn out and in some open part of the city have a trial of strength, seeing which can throw a stream of water to the greatest height or which can flood the other by pumping water into each other's engines. As firemen, they are most prompt and efficient, performing their perilous duties with the greatest zeal and intrepidity, as might be expected of men who undertake such a service for no hope of reward, but for their own love of the danger and excitement attending upon it, actuated at the same time by a chivalrous desire to save either life or property 
in trying to accomplish which they gallantly risk and frequently lose their own lives. This feeling is kept alive by the readiness with which the public pay honor to any individual who conspicuously distinguishes himself, generally by presenting him with a gold or silver speaking trumpet, that article being in the States as much the badge of office of a captain of a fire company as with us of a captain of a man of war. While any fireman who is killed in discharge of his duties is buried with all the pomp and ceremony by the whole fire brigade. Two miles above San Francisco, on the shore of the bay, is the Mission Dolores, one of those which were established in different parts of the country by the Spaniards. It was a very small village of a few adobe houses and a church, adjoining which stood a large building, the abode of the priests. The land in the neighborhood is flat and fertile, and was being rapidly converted into market gardens. But the village itself was as yet but little changed. It had a look of antiquity and completeness, as if it had been finished long ago, and as if nothing more was ever likely to be done with it. As is the case with all Spanish-American towns, the very style of the architecture communicated an oppressive feeling of stillness, and its gloomy solitude was only relieved by a few listless, unoccupied-looking Mexicans and native Californians. The contrast to San Francisco was so great that on coming out here one could almost think that the noisy city he had left but half an hour before had existence only in his imagination. For San Francisco presented a picture of universal human nature boiling over, while here was nothing but human stagnation, a more violent extreme than would have been the wilderness as yet untrodden by man. Being but a slightly reduced counterpart of what San Francisco was a year or two before, it offered a good point of view from which to contemplate the miraculous growth of that city, still not only increasing in extent, but improving in beauty and in excellence in all its parts, and progressing so rapidly that, almost from day to day, one could mark its steady advancement in everything which denotes the presence of a wealthy and prosperous community. The mission, however, was not suffered to remain long in a state of torpor. A plank road was built to it from San Francisco, Numbers of villas sprang up around it, and good hotels, a race course, and other attractions soon made it the favorite resort for all who sought an hour's relief from the excitement of the city. At the very head of the bay, some sixty miles from San Francisco, is the town of San Jose, situated in an extensive and most fertile valley, which was all being brought under cultivation and where some farmers had already made large fortunes by their onions and potatoes, for the growth of which the soil is peculiarly adapted. San Jose was the headquarters of the native Californians, many of whom were wealthy men, at least in so far as they owned immense estates and thousands of wild cattle. They did not hold their own, however, with the more enterprising people who were now effecting such a complete revolution in the country. Their property became a thousandfold more valuable, and they had every chance to benefit by the new order of things. But men who had passed their lives in that sparsely populated and secluded part of the world, directing a few half-savage Indians in herding wild cattle, were not exactly calculated to foresee or to speculate upon the effects of an overwhelming influx of men so different in all respects from themselves. And even when occasions of enriching themselves were forced upon them, they were ignorant of their own advantages and were inferior in smartness to the men with whom they had to deal. Still, although too slow to keep up with the pace at which the country was now going ahead, Many of them were, nevertheless, 
men of considerable sagacity, and appeared at no disadvantage as members of the legislature, to which they were returned from parts of the state remote from the mines, and where as yet there were few American settlers. San Jose was quite out of the way of gold hunters, and there was consequently about the place a good deal of the California of other days. It was at that time, however, the seat of government, and consequently a large number of Americans were here assembled, and gave some life to the town, which had also been improved by the addition of several new streets of more modern-looking houses than the old mud and tile concerns of the native Californians. Small steamers plied to within a mile or two of the town from San Francisco, and there were also four horse carriages which did the sixty miles in about five hours. The drive down the valley of the San Jose is in some parts very beautiful. The country is smooth and open, not so flat as to appear monotonous, and is sufficiently wooded with fine oaks. But toward San Francisco it becomes more hilly and bleak. The soil is sandy. Indeed, excepting a few spots here and there, it is nothing but sand, and there is hardly a tree ten feet high within as many miles of the city. End of chapter 4, part 2